Okay, today we're going to take a look at how to analyze graphs of functions, section 1.5. Now, for the graphs of functions, we've already looked at um, from an algebraic point of view, just looking at the formulas and how to manipulate them. In this section, we're going to look at the graphs. So the graph of function f is a collection of word pairs. That's just your domain and range. So x such that, or such that x is always in the domain of f. Okay. So, in other words, if I have a problem like this, I want to think about, well, what's the domain and range? Well, first off, I draw it real quick or punch in the calculator. Now, this one's easy enough where if I want to draw it, it's x squared, so it's going to be a parabola. Negative x squared, so it moves up and down, and its y-intercept is 3. So it's going to hit up here at 3, and it's going to open down. So now, the domain, this thing is going to extend left and right forever, so my domain is just going to be all real numbers. The range, though, is limited. The range only goes as high as this 3. So I'm going to put down that it has to be less than or equal to the 3. So domain left, right, range up, down. Now, this observation provides a convenient visual test. Is it the graph that I think can always tell us the function or not? Just a vertical line test. So once you graph it, draw a vertical line. If it intersects no more than one time anywhere, then you're good. So this one, if I go back up here, vertical line is going to only hit once. That should all be review for you. should be in good shape. Okay, now my graph looks like this. And then we have an issue because if I drew a vertical line through this, it would hit twice. That means it's not a function. So, would this one pass the vertical line test? Well, again, we have a parabola. Since the x is squared, it is going to be opening up or down. In this case, down. So, probably opening up or down, you're fine. Left or right, if y was squared, then we have a problem. So yes, it does pass. All right. A couple other things as far as graph goes. Uh, zero is a function of the x value whenever the f of x. In other words, whenever the y is equal to zero. So if you want to find those, you can just plug that value in. So if I want to find the zero for this function, the f of x, or the y value, is going to be zero. Then I have the 2x squared plus 13x minus 24. Honestly, I would just factor it. You can graph it and find the intercepts that way. This one factors fairly easily, though, because to multiply these first, you get 2x. You're only going to have 2x next. Then to get negative 24, one's positive, one's negative, but I want positive 13. So chances are it's going to be like this. And then I just want to figure out values that would work for that. So if I try 6 and 4, well, 6 and 4, negative 6 plus 8, nope. So I need a little bigger than that, so I'm going to try the 3 and the 8. So that's negative 3 plus 16 gives you 13, and that works. Set them both equal to 0 and solve. So I get x is equal to 3 halves, and x is equal to negative 8. Okay. As far as when it's increasing or decreasing, uh, the book doesn't have a lot, of, a lot of math speak on this, honestly. Look at the graph. You always read from left to right, and which way is it going? What this is saying is if you're looking from a, some x value to another x value, if that's smaller and it's in, if it's the x1 is smaller than the x2, well, that means that in order to be increasing, it must be true about these as well. This is just going from left to right. This is saying this number gets bigger as you go. If it gets smaller, well, it's still going left to right, and then it's decreasing. If it stays the same, then it's constant. So when is this increasing? Well, here I would graph it. So I'm going to put this into a graphing calculator. So y equals x cubed plus 3x squared minus 1. I'm just going to use the standard, make sure my window is just typical. And I know it's x cubed, so I know it should be following this general pattern. I know there's not going to be anything else going on outside of this, because I have a maximum of three zeros. So it's going to be increasing up to this point. So I'm increasing oops, from negative infinity 
up until that point. So I want to find that peak. So I'm going to hit second and calc. Go down here to maximum. I'm going to mark to the left of that peak, to the right of that peak, and then guess close to it. And it gives me a maximum of negative 2, 3. So that tells me this point occurs at negative 2. So I'm going to go from negative 3 to negative 2. And then again, this low point, well, my, my drawing is kind of poor here, sorry. This low point looks to be about 0. So I'm going to go second calc again, minimum. Left boundary somewhere over here, right boundary somewhere past it, and guess in between. Now that number, negative 2 times 10 to the negative 6, yeah, that's the same thing as 0. So I'm going to go 0, it's increasing again from the 0 up to infinity. So that means the only kind of thing decreasing is between those two things. So in other words, from negative 2 to 0. Okay? So, increasing decreasing functions as far as the terminology goes, you have a relative min and a relative max. Relative min, obviously, is the low point where anything around it is increasing. Relative max, or anything around it, I should say, is above it. Relative max, anything directly around it is below it. Okay. So, if I want to approximate the relative maximum of this function, honestly, we're not going to do too much of an approximation. We're going to just use the calculator and cheat a little bit. So, go ahead and graph this one. So, clear off what you have. Negative 4x squared minus 7x. Now, the 4x squared tells me it's going to be a parabola. Negative shows me it's going to go down. So, there's your parabola. So, if I want to find the max of that, again, I'm just going to do second count. Left, right, middle. Your maximum occurs at approximately negative 0.875 and 6.063, roughly. Not too bad overall. All right. Um, next up, we're going to look at rate of change. Line through two points is called a secant line, and the slope of that line is denoted as. Honestly, you don't see that very much. So it should just be m. Um, but that just means slope of the secant line. That's why they're doing that. It's kind of like this. If I have a circle, you have a tangent line. There's a line that's bisecting two parts, or you have a tangent line. This hits twice, or this hits once, this hits twice. So this is called a secant line, whereas this is a tangent line. So the same thing if I'm on a curve. This line would be a secant line. And later on, we'll get into the lines that are also tangent to the curves. So, if I want to find the average rate of change of the function, they're going to give you the values that's in between. Honestly, all this is a slope. These are your x values. You need to find the y values. So, if you think about slope, slope is equal to change in y over change in x. So delta y, delta x, and times. It's called. So, for this one, I'm just going to plug those in. Well, I need to figure out what f of negative 1 is. Well, it's negative 1 squared minus 2 times negative 1. But it's going to give me 1 plus 2, which is equal to 3. So negative 1 gives me 3. So I'm going to put those in 3 over negative 1 minus. And for the other one, if I do f of 3, that's going to be equal to 3 squared minus 2 times 3, or 9 minus 6, or again, 3. Well, at that point, it doesn't matter what your denominator is because you get. 0 over negative 4, which is just the slope of 0. Not too bad. Um, slope of 0 means it's just going to be a straight line. Between those two points, you're just going to have a flat line, so your slope is constant. Again, for the other next one, plug in 0. That's obviously just going to be 0, so I'm going to put that one second. If I plug in 1, that gives me 1 minus 2 times 1, so 1 minus 2, so 
uh, negative 1. That comes from the 1. So that gives you a slope of negative 1. Now let's do this apply quite a bit as well. If I look at the average speed of the car, honestly, that's asking for the same thing. It's just asking you for the slope. So I'm going to plug these in. I'm going to do S of 5 minus S of 0 divided by 5 minus 0. If I plug in 5 to this, that's 30 times 5 to the 3 fourths power. So I'll grab my trusty calculator. 30 times 5 raised to the 3 fourths. So we got 100.3. 1, 1, and then I'm just going to copy it, but go through and change the 5 to a 0. You should be able to figure out what that is without it. 30 times 0 is still 0. So I just have that divided by 5. which gives me 20.062. Right time point oh six. Now, speed, make sure you put these into units. Actually, they don't give me units on this, so I'm just going to stick with what it says. 20.06, 20 probably feet per second. But, yeah. Miles per hour, maybe? Nah, probably feet per second. Hard to guess when they don't give you enough information. The book's a little bit better about that. All right. Lastly, we're going to look at even and odd functions. Now, honestly, this isn't too bad to do. Even and odd functions mathematically means if you switch your inputs to the opposite sign, nothing happens. It's still the same thing. Okay, odd, if you put it in, it switches every single sign. So this ends up in practical terms. Even functions end up graphically. It's symmetric to the, the y-axis. Odd functions end up symmetric to the origin instead. So it has rotational symmetry versus uh, reflectional symmetry. Okay. So if I go down here, I can look at the graph real quick, or I can just think about what would happen if I plugged in a negative. If I plug in a negative. This is going to flip sign, but this won't. So that tells me this one's neither. You can also just graph it. It's a line that goes through 5 with a negative slope of 3. Well, that's not symmetric to the origin or to the y-axis. So that one's neither. Here, if I plug in a negative, it'll, nothing happens here. Well, there isn't an x here, so nothing happens here. If nothing happens when you plug in a negative, it's even. Graphically, this is a parabola starts at 2 and opens up. Well, it's definitely not going to be symmetric to the origin, but it's symmetric to the y-axis. Lastly, if I take this one, put in a negative, well, what do you think is left? It's probably going to be odd. But let's stop and actually look at it. Negative here, negative to the third power is going to stay negative. So 3 times a negative is going to flip to a negative 3x cubed. And this will change to a plus an x. Well, because it's exactly the opposite signs, it's going to be odd. If I were to graph this, that one, I'm not doing it in my head just by glancing at it, but if we plug it in, it is 3x cubed for minus x. And you should see that it goes through the origin, comes up above and below a little bit. But you can see that it has that rotational symmetry about the origin. And that's all you got for section 5.